I swear by Almighty God that the evidence that I shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Carter. Carter. Bill. Bill. Your name is Janet Mackenzie? Aye, that's my name. When did you first come to London? That was many years ago. Twenty-eight years ago. Where do you live? Now that Mrs. French, poor soul, is dead, I moved in with my niece at 19 Glenister Road. Uh, you were companion housekeeper to the late Mrs. Emily French. I was her housekeeper. I've no opinion of companions, poor feckless bodies, afraid to do a bit of honest domestic work. Quite. What I meant was you were on friendly terms, not altogether those of a mistress and a servant. Aye. Ten years I was with her and looked after her. She knew me and she trusted me. Oh, many's the time. I prevented her doing a foolish thing. Please tell us in your own words about the events of the evening of October the 14th. It was a Friday and my night out. I was going round to see my niece at Glenister Road, which is about five minutes' walk. I left the house at half past seven. I promised to take her a dress pattern that she admired. <laughs> oh, is this thing necessary? An excellent question. However, it has been installed at considerable expense to the taxpayers, so let us take advantage of it. Please continue. Well, when I got to my niece's, I found it left the pattern behind. So after supper, I slipped back to get it, as it was no distance. I got back to the house at 25 past nine. I let myself in and went upstairs to my room. As I passed the sitting room, I heard a prisoner in there talking to Mrs. French. No, it wasn't me. It wasn't my voice. Talking and laughing they were. But it was no business of mine, so I went upstairs and I fetched my pattern. Now, let us be very exact as to the time. You say that you re-entered the house at 25 past nine? Aye, the pattern was on a shelf in my room next to my clock, so I saw the time. And it was 25 past nine. Go on, please. I went back to my niece. Oh, she was delighted with the pattern. So... <sighs> Simply delighted. I stayed there until 20 to 11, and then I said good night to them and I come home. I went into the sitting room then to see if the mistress wanted anything before she went to bed. And there she was, dead, and everything tossed hither and thither. Did you really think that a burglary had been committed? My lord, I must protest. I will not allow that question to be answered, Mr. Myers. Miss Mackenzie, were you aware that Leonard Vole was a married man? No, indeed. And neither was the mistress. Janet! My lord, I must object. What Mrs. French knew or did not know is pure conjecture on Janet Mackenzie's part. Let me put it this way. You formed the opinion that Mrs. French thought Leonard Vole was a single man. Have you any facts to support that opinion? Well, there were the books that she ordered. There was the life of the Baroness Burdette Coutts and the one about Disraeli and his wife. Both of them about women that married men years younger than themselves. Ah, oh, I knew what she was thinking. I'm afraid we cannot admit that. Why? <laughs> Members of the jury, it is possible for a woman to read the life of Disraeli without contemplating marriage with a man younger than herself. <laughs> Miss Mackenzie, were you aware of what arrangements Mrs. French had made for the disposal of her money? She had her old will revoked and a new one drawn up. I heard her call on Mr. Stokes' solicitor. He was there at the time. The prisoner, I mean. You heard Mrs. French and the prisoner discussing her new will? Yes. He was to have all her money, she told him, as she had no near relations nor anybody that meant to her what he did. When did this take place? On October the 8th. One week to the day before she was murdered. Thank you. That concludes my examination. Uh, not just yet, Miss Mackenzie. Would you? Thank you. Miss Mackenzie, you have given evidence about two wills. In the old will, the will that was revoked, were you not to receive the bulk of Mrs. French's estate? Aye, oh, that's so. Whereas in the new will, except for a bequest to you of a small annuity, the principal beneficiary is the prisoner Leonard Vole. It'll be a wicked injustice if he ever touches a penny of that money. It is entirely understandable that you are antagonistic to the prisoner. Oh, I'm not antagonistic to him. He's a shifter, scheming rascal. But I'm not antagonistic to him. 
And I suggest you form this opinion because his friendship with your mistress cost you the bulk of her estate. I never liked him. Your candor is refreshing. Now, on the night of October the 14th, you say you heard the prisoner and Mrs. French talking together. What did you hear them say? I didn't hear what they actually said. You mean you only heard the voices, the murmur of voices? They were laughing. What makes you say the man's voice was Leonard Vole's? I know his voice well enough. The door was closed, was it not? Aye, not so. You were no doubt in a hurry to get the pattern, so you probably walked quickly past the closed door, yet you were sure you heard Leonard Vole's voice? I was there long enough to hear what I heard. Come, Miss Mackenzie. I'm sure you don't wish to suggest to the jury that you were eavesdropping. I know it was him in there with her. Who else could it have been? Exactly. What you mean is that you wanted it to be him. That's the way your mind worked. Now, tell me, did Mrs. French sometimes watch television in the evening? Yes. She was fond of a talk or a good play. Wasn't it possible on the evening when you returned home and passed the door that what you really heard was the television and a man and woman's voices and laughter? There was a play called... Lover's Leap on the television that night. It was not the television. Oh, why not? Because the television was away being repaired that week. That's why. <laughs> Silence! Silence! Oh. It's not time yet. If my learned friend has no further questions, I would like to... I have not quite finished. You are registered, are you not, under the National Health Insurance Act? Aye, that's so. Four and sixpence are paid every week. Oh, that's a terrible lot of money for a working woman to pay. I am sure that many agree with you. Now then, Miss Mackenzie, did you recently apply to the National Health Insurance for... A hearing aid. Uh, for, 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 for what? My lord, I must protest against the manner in which this question is being put. I will repeat the question, my lord. I asked you in a normal tone of voice, audible to everyone in open court, did you apply to the National Health Insurance for a hearing aid? Yes, I did. Did you get it? No, not yet. However, you state that you walked past a door which is four inches of solid oak. You heard voices, and you are willing to swear that you could distinguish the voice of the prisoner, Leonard Vole. Oh, who? Who? No further questions. Oh, maybe you could help me, Your Lordship. Six months ago, I applied for my hearing aid, and I'm still waiting for it. My dear Miss Mackenzie, considering the rubbish that is being talked nowadays, you are missing very little. You may stand down now. <laughs> Call Police Constable Jeffries. Police Constable Jeffries. Police Constable Jeffries. 